Welcome to another week of The Gospel Project as we're looking at the book of Romans this week. Many of you should be familiar with it. As a church, we spent a couple years as the pastors preached through the book of Romans, but now we're going to look at an overarching view looking at the gospel found in Romans. Now, you know, the book of Romans is giving this long, detailed argument, kind of outlining what the gospel is. And it really happens from chapters 1 through 10. You really see kind of what happens in order for us to be saved. And so that's why uh, for years, if you've learned ways to, to share the gospel, one of the earliest and simplest ways you might have learned was, was something called the Roman road. And it was the ability to give highlight verses from the book of Romans that give a clear picture of the gospel. Now, it's important we know a clear picture of the gospel because for us, when we share the gospel, it's important we share the key components the Bible would give. Oftentimes, I've heard over the years, as people give the gospel, they give periphery details or, or benefits of the gospel, and those will become uh, the gospel for them. In essence, you might hear somebody say, come to Jesus today because he has a plan for your life and he will give you purpose and hope. And so the gospel presentation somebody might give would just revolve around you uh, coming to uh, Jesus because now you've been lost your way in life and now when you find Jesus, you'll have purpose. He has a plan for your life. Well, while that is true, uh, Jesus isn't just simply a life planner, a hope giver. That's not the uh, sum total of the gospel. There is a much deeper problem we have in sin and a much greater purpose in Christ as our Savior that really makes the gospel a, a deep truth that oftentimes gets skimmed over. And that's why I think people are much more willing to uh, receive a gospel that's just simply, hey, I'll give you purpose or hope or joy to be found in Christ. And so uh, for us, as we look at this Roman road, I hope it's a reminder of the key things we ought to share. The, the pastor does it this way, uh, God, man, Christ in response, that we have a holy God and that man is sinful. He is separated uh, from this holy God. And Christ is our uh, Savior that now has come to uh, stand in our place to, pl to pay the penalty for our sin, to live the life we could not live. And in our place, He now stands in and now we are made right with God. And the only way we can have this gift found in Christ is through, the last part is response, to respond in repentance and faith in Christ. Now, those key terms can be found here in the book of Romans. So we'll just look through several key highlight verses. And the first one is really the theme of Romans comes from chapter 1. We'll look at how God's righteousness is revealed through the gospel. Romans 1 verse 16 says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Think about after all of our study through the book of Romans here as a church, how oftentimes the Jew and the Greek come up in the entire book. We see a point that the gospel is what saves no matter who you are. Verse 17, for in it is, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So in the gospel, not only is this great hope that we have in Jesus revealed, but also we see the righteousness of God. We have to understand that God is holy and perfect and we've sinned against that God. And we also understand that Jesus is the right, our righteousness. So all of that we see, uh, and, it's, and the way in which the gospel is uh, worked out in our life is through faith. That's where that phrase, from faith to faith, that's why that that phrase right there famously uh, impacted Martin Luther as he read through the scriptures and saw how crucial faith was in our uh, being reconciled to God. And so as we read Romans 1, we see verse 16, 17, th this becomes a thematic verse. If you, if you just read those couple of verses, it launches you really into the entire book, but it tells us that in this book, we're going to see there's a gospel for everybody, and it's going to be 
uh, to deal with the righteousness of God and the faith that you have to have in this God. So let's look at the second point here. All have sinned and have earned death. If you know the Roman road, you already have the Romans 3.23 in your mind, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But you, it's even found in Romans uh, 6.23, which is also part of this Roman road, for the wages of sin is death. We have to understand that everybody's a sinner Everybody falls short of this glory of God, and there's a price for that, and that's death. You know, this is an unpleasant truth to have to share. I think oftentimes it's skimmed over because of the difficult nature of what you have to say to a person. You have to look at your neighbor, your friend, your coworker, your family member, and say, you are a sinner. And because of your sin, you have been separated from a holy God. And there's a deep price for that. You're going to die. And not only are you going to die, you're going to spend forever in punishment for this sin. That's a, that's a terribly unpopular thing to say to someone. And so a lot of times I would say, just as I encourage you as you share the gospel, don't shy away from this point. Because you need this sort of fertile ground in a person's heart, they need to understand that they're a sinner before the gospel, the hope of Christ, actually can take root. A person must know the deep hole that they're in. They need to understand the nature of their sin. How can you repent of your sin without even knowing that you're in it? And so that's why it's so crucial that when we share the gospel, that we make sure people understand the depths of their sin. You have to know what kind of debt you're in before you need, need to pay it. It's just like a, a, a bill collector coming after you and saying, why haven't you paid your bill? You say, well, have you sent me any sort of invoices or anything? You say, no, I haven't sent you a thing. How would you ever expect to be able to pay a debt if you never knew you owed anything? And so the gospel is only good news to those who know they're in debt. And so as we share the gospel, it's important to know that we as difficult and unpopular as it is, Romans 3.23 and 6.23 take us to this truth of the costly nature of sin that we all have as we fall short of the glory of God. Here's a third one. God provided Jesus as a substitute for sinners. Now that we know there's this, this need for the sinner, we now uh, see the greatness of Christ. And this is uh, shown in Romans 5.8 and the second half of 6.23. So 5.8 says this, but God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So when we're in our sinful state, we're lost, dead in our sin, blind, we cannot understand spiritual things, and our hearts are drawn to choose sin. As that happens, Jesus died for us while we were in that state. He died in our place. 623 says this, second half, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And here we see the picture of Christ dying in our place, taking our sin. But not only that, we have the gift of Christ who now is our righteousness and he is uh, this gift of eternal life, and it's found in Christ Jesus our Lord. So there's a cost to sin, but there's this great gift found in the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is, this is a crucial uh, component in here because we have to understand that the means by which we are saved is the cross of Christ. Now, now a lot of people have heard the gospel uh, said enough times to where if you said what saves you, they might say Jesus dying on the cross for my sins. But oftentimes when really pressed of why they are accepted into heaven or God in some way takes them, they give a works-based answer. In other words, they'll say because I go to church or because I follow the commands of Christ. Now, while those are fruits that show evidence of their salvation, those things are not the reason they're saved. The reason that you go to heaven is because Jesus was your substitute in your place. So let me just help you with this in thinking about 
as you share the gospel and as you think about speaking the gospel to others, you should consider uh, asking more questions around their understanding about why Jesus died on the cross. You know, it's interesting. You say, why did Jesus die on the cross? He died on the cross for my sins. But if you press it too far, if the person really believes that God takes them because they live a good life, then what was the point of Jesus' death on the cross? If God was just going to take me because I just did some good things like Jesus, then Jesus, all, all Jesus had to do was come onto earth and be an example to me. But if, if Jesus died on the cross, that means that he was paying the penalty for my sin and at the same time his righteousness was becoming mine. So it's key that as you help people understand the gospel, that you hold it up, ask different questions, so you make sure they don't just have the rote answer they've been given a long time, but they actually have an understanding of the fact Jesus died in their place. That's what's crucial about this point in the gospel, is understanding Jesus in our place. Now, something happens as we receive Christ. It has to do with our uh, standing before God. That leads us to the fourth point. God reconciles and declares sinners righteous through Jesus. God reconciles and declares sinners righteous through Jesus. Now, let's look at Romans 5 on this uh, section here. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. More than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. And so for us, as we're as we're understanding we're reconciled to God, part of that is that we are justified by His blood. Let's just talk quickly about the term justification. It is that not that you are now made perfect. Because once we become Christians, it doesn't mean sin's gone and we don't ever sin anymore. What it means is you are now declared righteous in the courtroom of God. That now the record that is in your name before God himself is Jesus's holy and righteous record. It's not your own record, uh, it's his record. And it's not meaning that he's gonna change your record so that, change you so that you now earn your salvation. No, no, no. It's meaning that he just comes in and you go, okay, why is this guy getting into heaven? It's because of what Jesus did, not because of what he did. This is crucial because we also have to understand that it's not simply that Jesus wipes away our sins. It's not that he simply takes away the negative. That's not enough to get to heaven. It's that he is our actual righteousness, meaning that when he's in the courtroom, not only does he wipe away the mistakes we made, but he walks in and says, look at all the good deeds Christ has done so that now we actually are earning heaven through Christ. His righteousness is our own. That's what it means to be justified. That we have now, in our place, been called, not just the fact that he's cleaned the slate, but we've now been declared righteous. You now have the works of Christ placed on your life because of what he has done. That's what Christ has done for us. But all of this has come down to the point of what we are asked to do. He's the one who saves us. He's the one who died for us while we were still in our sins. So what does the Bible actually call upon us to do in response to God? Here's the fifth point. God saves all who trust in Jesus. Romans 10, 9 says, Because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, so there's confession, believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, Here's a biblical promise, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. Saves. For, for the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction, here's Romans 1 showing up again, between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing all his riches on all who call upon him. And in the verse you probably know, for everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There's this belief, this 
calling on the Lord. This confession that, that you believe that Jesus is your Savior. There must be a moment that you place your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible calls on us to do. And so when we share the gospel, we must echo this call the Bible has given. We must call on people to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved. And so we need to teach them the depths of their sin. We need to teach them the fact that it's not their righteousness, but they, the understanding of what it means to have Christ in your place, Him, him to uh, justify us before a holy God. And so as we lay those essential components of the gospel out, we must call on them to profess faith in Christ as well. And that sometimes even means telling them what it means if they don't profess faith in Christ and warning them of what path they might be going down. All of this to say, if this is the gospel, sin, righteousness of God, Christ in our place, this kind of appeasing the wrath of God being placed on Jesus, God initiating with us. He's the one who died for us while we were still sinners. If all of this is the gospel, think how often you've heard a gospel that shortchanges the truths found here in Romans. Think about how when you listen, do you hear the words of, about sin or God's righteousness or Christ in our place? Think about maybe as you hear different teachers or preachers, you should listen. Do they preach a full, clear gospel? And I think the same for you. When you approach a neighbor and friend and coworker, are you going over and giving the full gospel? I think this is one of the ways in which if you, I think a lot of times we struggle with sharing the gospel with neighbors or friends that are of a similar faith. They may go to a Christian church. They may even believe they're evangelical. And oftentimes, they don't see any difference between your faith and theirs. But you, you know internally something's off. You know that it seems like what they're doing is gospel light. Well, well the best thing you can do is go back to these core truths and make sure they're central to what they understand and what it means to be saved. Ultimately, we need to be people that are sharing this truth of this gospel with those we're around. And so one of the things I would just leave you with this challenge and something to think about is I, I never want to, over the years, I've never wanted to, to set any sort of numbers goals based upon how many people I might win to Christ. Simply because I, I have zero control over whether a person professes faith in Christ or not. That is purely in their heart. The one thing I do have a role in is whether a person comes face to face with the truths of the gospel. I can share the gospel with them. I can give them these truths. So over the years, as I've set goals in regards to sharing my faith, They've always revolved around sharing and not so much about how many people convert or profess faith. So maybe as we conclude this lesson, you might want to say this week, my goal is to share one or part or portion of these truths or all of them with three people this week. I want to have a conversation with three people about these things. And that's your goal. You set out to say, I'm going to have gospel conversations with those I'm around, calling on them to profess faith in Christ. I'm not saying that you don't call on them to respond. I'm just saying that you should set your goals and your success and your aim to be based off of how you share. And then you leave the results to the Lord and His work in their heart. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, use us as a witness for the gospel this week. We pray you would bring us to contact with people that 
need to hear this truth. Help us to be faithful with the opportunities you've given us. And Lord, we pray you would work in the lives of those we're around to turn their hearts towards you and to save them. We pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.